Welcome to Draft Deeper on the No Ceilings NBA podcast feed. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the podcast. Joining me as always is my producer, Kevin Black, my co-host, Stephen Gillespie and Maxwell Baumbach. Boys, we're here. It's another monthly mock posit draft. It's that time. We're updating the big board on No Ceilings NBA and as well as our composite mock draft. We already did those things. So if you haven't seen our big board or mock draft updates on No Ceilings, please Go ahead and do so. No NBA.com. Make sure you're subscribed. We have plenty of good information on there. Some surprising picks were made in that mock draft, to say the least. I think we have a few decent rankings up as well. Some, some certainly some prospect movement as far as up and down. So make sure you're checking out all of those things on our Substack, no NBA.com. But we are here for the draft deeper composite mock draft that we call the mock posit draft. So what does that mean? So along with us getting together a composite ranking for no ceilings, NBA.com, the three of us also get a composite ranking together of our respective big boards. And we use that as our player pool for a first round draft exercise. I promise the next mock posit draft we do, we will expand it. We will do a full two round mock draft, but for now, haven't even gone through the tournament yet. We're just sticking with first round. But our composite 60 player big board across us draft fine draft deeper folk. That's what we're using as our player pool to make picks within the first round of our mock draft scenario. We do a tankathon lottery sim. So, no, this is not going off the current standings. This was a lottery sim that I did a few days ago to get us in preparation ready to roll for this podcast. So, yes, some things may seem out of order. I promise it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to spark some dialogue. We're going to have some debate amongst ourselves as we always do. This is what we like to do here at Draft Deeper. So that 60-player pool, it opens things up as we know as well. Like Steven can go choose a player who's 57th on the composite board. He can take him inside the first round if he really wants to. It opens up the discussion. We always throw some surprises out. So without further ado, let's get it going. So I'm on the clock. San Antonio Spurs. First pick overall. We reset our order back around, so I will be picking first. Steven's up second. Maxwell will be up third. So San Antonio Spurs, we're not going to waste any time. We're going to get Victor Wembanyama off the board here. He is an interesting fit for the San Antonio Spurs, right? Because they they need a center after trading away Yaka Pearl. They don't really have any true long-term options on the roster. They have guys like Charles Bassey, and they have some other big men available, but we wouldn't consider those to be long-term franchise centerpieces at that position. So getting a guy like Victor Wembanyama, now you're really shoring up the front line, right? You have him, you have Jeremy Suhan, who's been making some noise of late in the NBA as a rookie, Kelda Johnson, Devin Vassell, Malachi Branham. You have all of these names at these other positions. They're still technically missing a point guard, which is why if the Spurs ended up with number two pick, I don't think those fans should, wouldn't necessarily be salty about that either because then they would be able to draft Scoot Henderson more likely than not, who would be a long-term option at that point guard spot. But when you're getting Victor, you're not passing on him despite potentially needing someone else at a different position. You're getting a generational franchise-changing talent who can be the best player on a championship-level team if all breaks right, as we're projecting with his career. So San Antonio would once again get that face of the franchise player. They had Tim Duncan. They had guys like Tony Parker, Manu Ginobili. They had Kawhi Leonard. Ever since Kawhi Leonard made his exit in that trade to Toronto and they brought in DeMar, yeah, DeMar's a great player, but they haven't really had that same face of the franchise level talent in that organization. So Victor Wembanyama would bring us back to hopefully those Spurs days of old where we could count on some of those really fun Western Conference rivalries being powered and, and running through the Riverwalk if we will, of San Antonio, Texas. So Victor Wembanyama's off the board, number one overall. Steven, I didn't technically give you guys introductions. I was so excited to just go into the mock draft tonight on the episode. How are you doing, first of all? I'm doing great, man. I'm happy to be here. Um, it's always fun when we get to do these mock positive episodes because it's just like a culmination of all of our scouting up until this point of the season. Mm -hmm. And like you said, man, like it sparks some really good dialogue and we kind of start theorizing where players actually fit into the NBA as opposed to just looking at film and evaluating their skill set and how teams value them. Like this makes it a little bit more uh, formalized of an evaluation. 
Absolutely. So you're on the board, number two overall, the Orlando Magic. Mm-hmm. The Magic definitely have some guards on the roster. They 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 have players by position group, right? Like you you yeah. have guards like Markel Fultz, Cole Anthony. You have bigger wings like Paolo and Franz. You have a big like Wendell Carter. They they have players up and down the roster, and they've been really competitive in the Eastern Conference of late. But I'm assuming you're going to go the direction of giving them one of the best franchise changing talents we have in this draft class. Am I, am, am I wrong or am I right? Uh, you are correct if you're referring to Scoot Henderson. Yes. yes. Uh, I think he might be the best point guard prospect since like OG Isaiah Thomas, you know, dating back even further than where a lot of people are kind of comparison. Like Maxwell, for instance, wrote a phenomenal piece comparing him to Derrick Rose. I mean, if you date back even further, you have some pretty prominent point guard prospects that have uh, found their way to the Hall of Fame and have left their mark on the NBA at large. I think Scoot has a real chance to be the best version of a player that we have seen before. And I think that holds incredible value. And I think, too, that Orlando is in a unique opportunity where if they draft Scoot, they can say, we really wanted this guy. And Scoot had to hear all year long about how he would be the number one prospect if mm-hmm. it was any other if it was any other season. So he's going to have a chip on his shoulder the size of, you know, the world, right? Wimby's out of this world. Scoot's going to have a chip on his shoulder the size of the world. And I think Orlando, he and Paolo and Franz and Wendell Carter are going to be a formidable young core growing up. And I, I understand that they, quote unquote, don't need a point guard because of Marco Fultz. You still draft Scoot here. You, you absolutely, you take the best player available. And Steven did a great job in bringing up Maxwell's piece that he wrote, his comparison piece between Scoot Henderson and Derek Rose. Because Maxwell, that's that's been a point of conversation, right? Like as Steven said, mm-hmm. who is Scoot Henderson the best pure point guard prospect since? So I'm curious, first of all, how are you doing tonight? Since I didn't technically introduce I, you either. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually doing pretty bad, guys. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, <laughs> I'm doing great. I'm excited. It's mock posit It's a mock time. posit. We're Come right, on, yeah. No, I'm fired up. I'm in a great mood. So w- was there anything in doing that dive? I know you have plenty of words mm-hmm. written about it. I would advise everyone to check out that piece on noselingsnba.com. But in relation to Scoot specifically, was there anything you picked up going back through a whole bunch of tape on both of those guys that you noticed about Scoot where you're like, I didn't necessarily pay as much attention to this prior. I didn't realize he was this good in this area. Was there anything new you picked up after doing another deep dive? Um, I, yeah, I don't necessarily know that there was anything new as much as just reaffirming like how special he is. Like it's, Mm -hmm. he is so fast and so mature and so good defensively for such a young player that like, it's, it's really rare. It's really rare. I think the one like hang up I had with Scoot coming out of it, um, was he's not totally fluid as a decision maker. Like at times he will, um, he seems a little too locked into like, I'm shooting on this possession or I'm trying to set somebody up with the pass on this possession. Mm -hmm. Um, But all in all, like he can really play. Uh, I, I saw a lot of chatter today on Twitter about how, you know, maybe he's not the decisive number two overall pick in like, I can't believe we're doing that. Cause like, I, I, yeah, I can't believe we're doing it, but I also feel like, the gap has widened for reasons that have nothing to do with Scoot. Like I'm picking third here. And like, I, I think the people I was considering for this spot have actually been sort of let down this year. Um, yeah, I, I just have a really hard time seeing a guy in a professional league who came into the year being noted as a phenomenal athlete, a guy who's polished a wonderful decision maker, a mid range killer. And he shot the big question was the jump shot. And he's, almost 36 percent from three in total on the mm-hmm. year now and we're like oh is it, are we sure this guy's number two what are we doing like i think like there's been I, i've seen we're bored. every single prospect <laughs> is like are we overthinking this guy are we overthinking this guy people are overthinking scoot now like it's it's not that hard it's not that hard it, it's, it's it's not, not even funny and... anymore it's frustrating it's very, maxwell very frustrating. you you had you had the best point out of everything that you said when you stated that the guys that you're mulling over for number three overall, like you're Mm -hmm. not necessarily wild about all of them to the level that you should be for a number three overall pick. Mm -hmm. And I agree a hundred percent. And if that's the takeaway from scouts like us, how could we possibly put any of those names 
over someone like Scoot, who has the, the, the now two year body of work in a grown man's league, like the G League. I, right? Like, how, how can how yeah. can we do that? Well, I have an especially hard time. I don't want to start killing this. Whatever. I, we're, we're no, no, no. There. Come on. You, no, you, you, okay. you, you, you I, okay. unwrapped it now. I have an especially hard time hearing the scoot isn't number two argument when the player being argued ahead of him is somebody who plays in a much worse league who had the jump shot concern going in and has not gotten any better at jump shooting or, or much else. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I understand you, you've got to play who's in front of you, but I, I just don't, see, I, I really think the gap has widened significantly. And like part of that scoot and part of it's everybody else. And I, I don't sh- mean to be a downer and just like dumping on everybody right before I make my pick. Like, I think there's a lot of guys who could have really good and even really great careers. Like the ceilings on these guys are still really high. This there's is not a great top 20, like in the draft, right? The mm-hmm. problem I is, agree. is like, yeah, the top 20 is strong. Making the decision at three, four and five with guys who, when we go back and compare them, Stephen, to like prospects of past drafts, like guys who we thought were slam dunk third pick, slam dunk fourth pick, like are we really feeling the same way about these guys? Is that are you are you kind of in that same boat? Like you're you're not necessarily in love with your like three through five, six, seven guys either. Do you think we're going to get there and we're just being pessimistic because it's that time of the year and then at, at some point when it comes April, May, June, we're going to fall more in love with our boards and where we are. Like, well, where are you kind of at with this before we let Maxwell make his pick at number three? I love my prospects one through five, six, seven, and eight are a nightmare. And I feel like they're in a tier <laughs> of their own because they have to be because they have these preconceived ceilings and they're all theoretical players right now. Like that's legitimately, they're in a tier that you have to consider them in that range because of of reasons that's essentially it right like just because of reasons Reasons. and then (laughs) when i get to nine through 22 i get really excited about the potential that all of those prospects have like my six through eight players are players that'll get you fired if they hit if they hit and if you miss they'll also get you fired so it's um that's really scary and that's also challenging right and i think people confuse like the quality of a class with how hard you have to work to figure out your evaluation. And I think that's where we're at right now is we're calling this draft like kind of weak in certain regards, but it's because you kind of have to work for your evaluations this time. They're not as readily apparent, I would say. I think there's a real chance that this draft kind of ends up like 2020 where like, it's on its head before. Yeah. yeah. Like the four through 10 range in hindsight ends up kind of being like, wait, what? And then like yeah. 11 is Devin Vassell. 12 is Tyrese Halliburton. And then mm-hmm. like Desmond Bain goes 30. Like, I think there's some of that kind of potential here where like fit is going to matter a lot. Circumstance mm-hmm. is going to matter a lot. And like some of these guys might really hit and some of them might really not. Like there's some real scary floors and some real high ceilings mixed in here. And that's oh, exciting. Man. It's, it's fun. Oh man! So what? What a way to set the stage for a, a first of all a tankathon sim that's kind of on its head mm-hmm. as well, right? We have a bunch of teams jumping up in this lottery order we're picking through. So to recap, the Spurs actually got the first overall pick in the scenario. I went Victor Wembanyama. The Orlando Magic got the second pick. So Steven went Scoot Henderson. Now we have jumping up to the third spot, as if the rich couldn't possibly get any richer, right? If everyone's healthy, if everything's breaking right, we've seen what the New Orleans Pelicans can do in the Western Conference. They can be one of the best teams out West and can keep getting better in regards to the health of Zion Williamson, in regards to the health of Brandon Ingram. They already have a bunch of young talent even behind them who are getting better by the game, like Trey Murphy, Dyson Daniels, Jose Alvarado. I mean, those that shoot, Jose Alvarado was tearing it up in in All-Star Weekend last Mm -hmm. night. I I, I was loving watching that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was loving watching Jose Alvarado, but Maxwell, New Orleans Pelicans, third overall. Mm-hmm. Are you taking a flyer on somebody who is is rocketed up your board because reasons like Steven mm-hmm. outlined? Are you going with a guy who's maybe maybe produced in front of us a little more than some of his peers? Where, where are you going with that third pick? Yeah, I'm just going to go with safe, reliable production, a guy that we've seen, you know, kind of really prove his prove himself at the college level and you should know what you're getting. I'm taking Drew Timmy. Uh, from Gonzaga. No, uh, beautiful. Uh, yeah, oh, just an unknown exactly commodity. the move I would have made. A yes. real spark plug. No, um, my actual beautiful pick is hair. 
uh, is Brandon Miller. Um, Brandon Miller is the guy here. He's a very good three point shooter. And I think the thing that I think is, is really started to bite the Pelicans. Like when you look at where they were earlier in the season versus where they are now, is there still a team that doesn't take a lot of threes? Um, and like Herb Jones, like really came out of the gate hitting his threes last year. And then like that percentage tailed off as the season went along. And now this year, like he's just really not hitting them. Um, I mean, you've got Trey Murphy and CJ McCollum who take a lot and can go nuclear. And like when, uh, you know, Brandon Ingram is healthy, he, he's a reliable three point shooter. Um, but they just don't have guys that take a ton of threes. Like they're, they're 29th in the league in three point attempts on the year. So it's, it's like them and then the bulls. Uh, so I think just getting a guy like Brandon Miller in the door is, is going to alleviate that pretty significantly. Um, there's some real flaws to his game, obviously like there's, you know, the, the interior finishing and things like that, but like, that's not going to be his role at all in this team. Like you have Zion Williamson to pressure the rim. You don't need him in there. You're going to have um, a, a big body like Valanchunas to bang around in there. Like that's just not going to be what he does. It's going to be skip it or shoot it. That's it. That's it's going to be a very simplified offensive game. Uh, I like what he does defensively. I think he communicates really well on that side of the floor. I think I'm a little higher on his feet than some of the skeptics are. I think his feet are, are okay. Um, and I think that as he fills out his frame, he should be able to guard up pretty well. Uh, and I, I, I don't think he's toast to guarding down either, but he's just a absolute nuclear three point shooter yeah. on a team that desperately needs shooting. And I think given where this organization wants to go, I think it makes a little bit more sense to do this rather than being like, and we have to devote a ton of time to developing a Ben Thompson, like, or, you know, some of the other real high ceiling guys, like a SAR even like you just, you're competing. It, it, you don't have time to mess around. You've just got to go. Um, yeah. And I think Brandon Miller makes the most sense. No, I agree. 100%. I, I would, I would go BPA by our composite board. BPA says Brandon Miller and he's mm -hmm. as Maxwell outlined. He can be a seamless fit almost wherever he goes. Cause he doesn't need, even though having the ball in his hands, right. That's what you would want him to be in terms of ultimate upside outcome. But in theory, he doesn't need the ball in his hands as much as some of these other players that we could project to go third overall. So Brandon Miller was a great pick, Maxwell, and probably who I would have loved to actually select for my team, the Washington Wizards at number four overall. That's where they're sitting in this tankathon scenario. And I got to be honest, boys, I hate all the freaking picks here for really? the Washington Wizards. I, I hate I hate all of some can I explain why? I know who no, I'm gonna no. go with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know who I'm gonna go with. I'm gonna go with Jarris Walker, who is my third overall prospect on my board and somebody who I just think is gonna come into the NBA, you know, be able to kick ass and, and take names and all that fun stuff. But even with Jarris, so the guys who we have in our composite four through seven, right? So we got guys like Jarris Walker we got guys like the the Thompson twins. We have somebody like a, like a Keontae George. We have all of these guys who are in this range. Jarris Walker, Cam Whitmore, Soren, and Men Thompson are probably the four who I would be more inclined to draft in this pool in terms of at four overall. An organization like the Washington Wizards have not proven they can develop anybody in, in recent years. That's just unfortunately been the case. And when we talk about both Thompson twins, who are very special talents in and of themselves, but – have had questionable outcomes as far as their own personal development over the last year and a half. I think what, what whether we see some good things happening for them, particularly with a SAR on the tape, but with the men, even with a SAR in some respects, there are clues on the tape to lead us to believe that there are certain areas of their game where they just haven't improved or developed in. And Cam Whitmore, I, I, I was a Cam Whitmore guy since the McDonald's All-American game last year, but I think as we would all acknowledge – he is also going to need some time to develop and, and round out his game to really become the type of player that we want to project him to be at fourth overall. And to an extent, that's even the same case for Jairus Walker. We've seen Jairus Walker take more reign in the offense within a Houston system of late, but he's been playing in a situation where he has Jamal Shedd, Marcus Sasser, and Tremont Mark, and all these guys around him who want to handle the ball, take shots, and, and leave Jairus Walker with more of the cleanup responsibilities within that team really on both sides of the ball. We haven't seen everything that he can do either, but at the same time, I still feel like he's going to need some further development to get to where we think he's going to be in the NBA. So I'm looking at guys who are all developmental projects to, to certain varying degrees, in my opinion. I'm going to take the guy who I just feel the best about that in three to five years from now, 
I have the most confidence that he's going to be, maybe he might not be the best player of that group, but he's going to be the type of player that we know is going to come in and make a difference on both ends of the floor for an NBA team for a long time. So I'm going to take the certainty for a team that needs certainty, especially if they're going to keep Bradley Beal. We don't know what's going to happen with Kyle Kuzma. We don't know what's going to happen with, with Porzingis. We don't, for shit, we don't even know what's going to happen with Bradley Beal, right? He could all of a sudden, he could ask out, he could, he could want to trade, you know, in the offseason. And they could quite literally have to hit the full reset button to where the cupboard's incredibly bare there. It's 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 Denny Avdia, it's Corey Kispert, it's Johnny Davis, who everyone's wanted to pile on about his rookie year. W- what's left to be there? I need some kind of certainty. So give me Jairus Walker at, at number four. So Maxwell, that's my long-winded answer of why I hated all of the picks there at number yeah. four and why I would go Jairus. But, I but just, after I said that, what do you think? Yeah, I just, I would, this is actually where I would really consider taking a man who I was I would really hard on because I, I think this is a men team. Look, like I know that you're, that their developmental track record is rough, but that should never be the reason to be like, well, now we got to stop trying. Like this is a team that desperately, desperately, desperately needs to do something to try and raise their future ceiling. And like, I, I just do it. I just take a man and be like, I'm throwing you to the wolves. Go, go figure it out. Because that's like, that's their best chance at turning this thing around. And I, I love Jairus Walker. I don't know that he like, he alone doesn't change your franchise's fortunes. And I think there no, is a doesn't. chance that a man could do that. And that's why I would just be like, well, we're, we're going for it. And as much crap as we give Washington, they always want to be relevant. Right. So it's not like we, we, we make fun of their draft picks and we say like, why do you always like, instead of just blowing it up, why do you want to be in contention? Like that's not a bad thing that your organization wants to be competitive, right? Like they might misdiagnose who they have on their roster, but they want to succeed. So I don't know if necessarily the, the development is bad or if they just continue to draft like players that all play the same position, like every draft. No, I, I, I agree with that to an extent. And to your point about Amen Thompson, they do technically need a point guard for long term. They have they have Wright under contract. They have Monte Morris under contract for one more year after this one. But after that, they do technically need a long term point guard. I'm, I just don't know. No, I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm gonna go Jairus Walker at fourth overall. Steven, you're on the clock with the Houston Re. You can take Amen Thompson. If yeah, I'm not gonna, you, you, you can I'm do not it. Do that. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Who so, are you going to take for the Houston Rockets? So I said that Washington is a men team. Houston is not in a men team. I do not want to put a men Thompson who has not improved the one week area that we knew that he had coming into the season at all through the season and then putting him in Houston. I want to, I'm going to take a player who I'm really high on. I know relative to both of you, and he's the highest remaining guy on my board. I'm going to go Keontae here. I think that taking him, he is also a great shooter, um, really good, tough shot maker. I don't think that he slows down the development or the progression of a Jalen Green. I think that he actually complements him quite nicely. He's a great def- uh, point of attack defender. He's also grown as a playmaker during season. I'm a huge in-season development guy. I just think that the tough shot making, the ball handling, the point of attack defense – he has the attitude that I think will actually kind of help Houston, whereas I don't know if a man can kind of overcome is as great as a like work ethic and everything that he has. I don't think that he has the game to kind of back up his work ethic like in the immediate that I think would help Houston, whereas Keontae I feel much better about his kind of NBA skill level um, right off the jump. So I'm going to go Keontae George here. So are you essentially just buying all into, let's just run the whole offense through Opera and Shangoon. Let's hope that Jalen Green and Keontae George give us enough secondary on the margins. And that's kind of just how we're going to run the offense. I'm assuming that's I, what you're thinking. I'm, no, I'm, I'm still big on Jalen Green, like taking a leap. I know that we were kind of expecting it the second year. I still think that he has a lot to offer as like a, like the guy on a team. And I think Keontae kind of being the de facto one, being able to play off of him and be able to take some of the scoring load away from him if when he needs it. I still think that Jalen Green has a lot of juice to offer as like a a next level guy in the NBA. And I think that George kind of plays off of him very nicely. Okay, so we have technically gone one through five 
in our draft deeper composite board. We had Victor Omanyama, Scoot Henderson, Brandon Miller, Jairus Walker, and Keontae George in that order in our composite ranking. So I'm assuming, Maxwell, given your opportunity here, the Detroit Pistons, they do need some help on the wing, especially now that Sadiq Bey has found himself in Atlanta. This is a prime opportunity to finally draft one of the Thompson twins, or you could just throw us a, a curveball and go a different direction. What are you going to do? Yeah, I'm going to take the guy that I'm like still holding stock in that I think everyone else has moved on from and take Cam Whitmore here. Mm. <laughs> um, and look, I don't even like blame everybody for moving on for, from Cam Whitmore. Like, can, can I, I just say really quick before you get into like your explanation that this yeah. pick right here seems like the most likely at, after three, right? So this four through six cluster, this seems like the pick that would be most likely to happen in, in actual real life, like on draft night, just given um, Troy Weaver's background of loving like hyper athletic guys. Like this seems like a pick that I feel like could actually happen. So actually, I actually don't blame you for making this at all. I actually like that you did this. Yeah, I I think that um, with Cam, like there's there's obvious concerns, right? Like he's had he's had some real struggles this year defensively when it comes to guarding down. He's had some real issues just passing in general. Like he has is averaging less than one assist per game, like despite getting the ball a good amount. Um, doesn't really look for his teammates much. And I don't know how much that is just a role in this Villanova offense being a mess. And like Justin Moore came back and I used to really like Justin Moore and like, he's just chucking some stuff and it's like, well, this is a mess. Um, but I do think he shot it well. Like I know he's 33% mm -hmm. in the year, but he's 35% in conference play. He's taken some tough ones. Like I, I do still buy the shot with him. Um, do I think he shoots it right away in the NBA? No, but um, considering what, Sadiq Bay was as a shooter where it's like he took a lot of them and like was really vaunted as like a shooter but like the percentages were just fine could Cam Whitmore become that like I think that's possible um and he's a much better athlete than a guy like Sadiq Bay um really really fast and like phenomenal cutting instincts like when he's engaged as an off-ball offensive player his timing for when to cut to the basket and his ability to get to the basket really quickly off the ball is phenomenal um even when like a guy like uh, Oso Igadaro was guarding against him, he still managed to power his way to the basket. He is very, very strong going to the basket. I think he's physically ready to play in the NBA. Um, the defensive stuff is scary. And this is a team that's 29th in the league and points allowed per game. Um, changes of direction, give him a really hard time. Uh, offensively, like he's not the best separator either. His handle can be shaky. It's a very bullying reliant game. Like there, there's some, some serious translation issues that could be tough for him, but I just think from a physicality and athleticism stand perspective and thinking he's a good enough shooter, I think he does manage to stick around the NBA, even if things go really, really awry. Um, but I just think what he brings them as far as his athleticism um, and shooting is, is appealing enough here. Are you worried about him taking minutes away from Jalen Duran at the four in Detroit? <laughs> that was the other thing too. Like they've got so many bigs now. Like I, I that, I am still just not over that Sadiq Bay trade. That is, or the Wiseman one. That yeah, that's like everything about that is just it sits so so poorly with me. But what can you do? No, I I could I could see Cam Whitmore going to the Detroit Pistons, like I said. And honestly, Maxwell, I probably would have targeted Cam Whitmore right here at number seven. I'm up mm -hmm. for for the Charlotte Hornets. I could have absolutely seen him being a good fit for that organization. Right, they kind of need help at that combo forward spot. We, we don't know what's going to happen in the future with some of their other positions, but nevertheless, Cam Whitmore is off the board. So I'm up for Charlotte. I'm going to go a sore Thompson just cause we're, we're going to, we're going to stop the fall with both of the Thompson twins, but I can't go a men here because that fit with LaMelo ball would just be so clunky. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't see it working out to the best of its ability, but with a SAR, you get, the secondary playmaking, you get the scoring upside, you get the perimeter shooting, you get what he can do on defense when he's locked in, actively engaged. And oh, by the way, in my opinion, he's every bit the athlete that Amen is. I just think that Asar, in my opinion, has a better outcome to translating alongside other great players in relation to a man who everything kind of has to be built around a man offensively. And if the context isn't 
the greatest, then you could see some things fall apart because he's not that level of shooter and he has not gotten better as a perimeter shooter. So if you're going to be handling the ball and you're going to have a sky high usage rate in today's NBA, you better be able to shoot the ball. Otherwise, go find me a complimentary piece like a SAR who could also grow into a secondary or even a primary scoring option in his own right and still give you some of those awesome intangible and, and athletic benefits that you can get from somebody like a man. So give me a SAR for the Charlotte Hornets. Steven, you're up. We kind of went out of order a little bit. So Cam Whitmore was our ninth ranked player on our composite big board. Asar Thompson was more in line with where we were at, although he was still a little mixed up. He was our sixth player. So we're, we're out of order regardless. So where do you want to go with your eighth overall selection? Are you all ready to get spicy? Oh, let's do it. Let's do Are it. Are you all ready to get spicy? I, w- I was waiting for the spice to just kick off because it's I, draft deeper. We're going to bring. I'm spice, not taking so. him in here because why? Like Halliburton is the in- offensive engine to this team. They just need complimentary players, right? They want to. They want to compete. They got more picks coming, coming down the pipe. Give me Grady Dick. I'm going Grady Dick here. Grady Dick at number I'm going, eight. Woo. I'm going Grady Dick here, Woo. and I think that he perfectly complements what Indiana does. And I think that he has good defenders behind him in Indiana to kind of make up for it. Like they're going to funnel everything to Miles Turner. He is largely looked at as one of, if not the best shooting prospects in here. And he is a capable rebounder. He makes good reads whenever he's chased off the line. He's kind of working that little in-between game now. Makes smart reads. I just think that he would fit Indiana so nicely. And uh, again, I'm not saying that I have him ranked higher than Amin Thompson or actually a few other players on my board, but when I'm looking at Indiana, what they need, I think Grady Dick actually fits Indiana like really nicely. I don't even know if I have a response to that. That, I'm that, that I was... could never, I could never take him over, man. That was, and really I'm a Grady Dick guy. I like Grady. Dick, what do you but... do with the men on this team? Like, how does that I don't work? care? We'll See, you can put the ball in his hands. Ty- Tyrese Halliburton can, he play, can play off, off ball. ball. Ben Why do you want to take the ball, ball out of Ty? Why do you want to take the ball out of Tyrese Halliburton's hands? Because he's like a 44% three point shooter. Like he can just catch the ball and shoot it too. He's also like the league's leader in assists. Yeah. And, yeah. They, I, and you if don't there, do it all if the there's time. Anyone, if there's anyone who's going to be able to find a man, if he goes back door and then tries to be an actual cutter in half mm-hmm. court, get, I'm let, sorry, let guys, the guy like, who's leading the NBA in assists get him the ball. Why am I taking the the best player on my team who is thriving with the ball in his hand and saying, you know what would make you even better if we changed everything about what we're doing with you right now? I don't, I, I would never, if I'm Indiana, like. Well, Tyrese Halliburton plays alongside Adrian Emhart and it works just fine. Well, Adrian, Adrian Emhart needs the ball in his hand too. He doesn't it, need the ball in his hand. He can, it, he can shoot. He's a good weak side. He's also a good. Yeah. And Tyrese player. Halliburton can also shoot too. So what are, what are we he, doing here? Nathan, do you like? Do you guys really think that it's smart to take the ball out of Tyrese Halliburton's hand by drafting a Men Thompson? I'm saying you don't. You don't necessarily have to take it out of. You don't need to make a yeah. Men Thompson a 36 percent usage rate player just mm-hmm. because you're drafting him, right? And, and I just don't my, know my argument is if you're why going to I'm have drafting a man, my backup point guard at eight. I think the idea is ultimately that he's like a two. Like, I think the idea is that like you play, you find a way to play a Halliburton, a men and Matherin together. I, I mean, right. Matherin is also the two, <laughs> like that's the thing. Well, Matherin, like, I think you hope that like he continues to gain size and like he becomes a three. That correct. Correct. I don't know. Like I, there's no way that I'm taking a men and being like, we're going to like, we're going to take everything that we have going right now, taking the ball out of Matherin's hand, taking the ball out of Halliburton's hand. We have Hild, we have Turner, Nemhart's thriving. Like we have players on this team that are. I don't think we're performing. saying that Grady Dick isn't a fit in Indiana because I think we'd all agree that he is. I think it's more so. I think you trade down, obviously, if you can, right? But I'm just thinking, like, if I'm drafting for Indiana, like, Gundy why am I? Doing. Yeah, like, there's no reason that I am looking to be like, all right, guys. We're doing great with everything we're doing now. Let's all stop that so we can make a man a better player. 
It's honest to God, he, it's a very similar argument to what I did with taking Jairus at four for, for the Wizards. And you guys were like, well, maybe a men should have no, been you guys, there. Well, no, you guys – you you guys are strong. Like I said, that Washington is a men team. Like I could see a men fitting there. Like right, but I you're taking no. no. What I'm saying is you're taking Grady Dick because at the end of the day, you believe that he can fit with virtually any team we have on this board. And by taking him at eight, you're essentially getting a player who you believe and will make an impact, regardless of where they have to play up and down the lineup. That's the same argument I use for taking Jarris at, at at four. That's 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 that's, that's what I did. Right, that, I think that's what kind of what you did with Grady. Well, Jarris would be like I would take him just because he was the best player available. Like my argument for Dick here is not because he's the best player available. Right, your argument was what I just said. Right, right, more, but, more or less. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we we can we can move it along. I I think that we're looking at <laughs> your Jarris pick a lot differently, but I don't know if I'm Indiana. Like I'm taking, I'm not looking to take a man and be like, all right, now let's reshuffle our entire offensive philosophy to try to make you a better player. Because I don't think that he's, I don't think that he fits Indy. Okay. We, we, we will all agree to disagree, but nevertheless, yes. I love that Steven made it spicy because that, that conversation, that was much more dialogue than we probably would have gotten if you would have picked him in. <laughs> so I like it. Yeah. So, Maxwell. Will mm-hmm. you take a man Thompson yes. with the Orlando yeah. Magic second lottery pick? I will. Okay. Look, the fit is a disaster. Like <laughs> we now have Scoot Henderson, Jalen Suggs, uh, Cole Anthony, and Markel Fultz. This is that is a man. That's like, crusty. If, if you had to bet your life on a backcourt missing a three, like this would be <laughs> this would be the one. Um, yeah, like the, I, look, the fit is a disaster, but. Just strictly from a tier standpoint, I cannot let a man Thompson continue to fall. The ceiling is still outrageous here. Um, I do have some of the same concerns, like Steven mentioned with like Indiana. Like, I don't love the idea of like Paulo and Franz having the ball less, but I do love the idea that like I think Paulo is going to be- eventually become a better shooter than he is now. I think Franz is a real shooter. Um, I Carter think, can shoot it a little bit. Yeah, if like you think Bull Bull is gonna like be a guy, uh, yeah, you've got Wendell Carter who's like shooting threes. Like, there's a place for him to really make this work, and mm-hmm. I, and like we already took Scoot for them too. You got to keep in mind. Yeah. So like, there's not a lot of like there might not be as much on ball action for him as you would like, and like you are gonna have to compromise some things, and it might get a little bit messy. But like, I I just have a pretty severe drop off in tier after him and like i can't i can't let him continue to fall i gotta take him um my team has been really bad for a really long time and like any big bite at the apple we can take we'll take it um but i yeah i i don't love the fit but i like i really just can't pass on a guy who's that creative that fast has that much defensive upside like i i can't do it go ahead i just i just does this not impact where we probably should have him i know where we do have him right but he's there are like maybe three or four teams where you're just like this would be a team that should draft a man thompson but then outside of that it's like Uh who is he taking the ball away from because there are several teams that already have like a primary I, but I and think a lot how of much do we trust like you're the ancillary stuff that he can do. I don't trust the ancillary stuff at all, which is why I'm lower on him. Like, I think if he doesn't figure out the shot, like it could get real ugly. Cause right now he doesn't cut. He does not like physicality. He takes terrible angles, to the basket to avoid contact. He gets a star whistle in OTE. Like there's a lot of like stuff that scares me with him. He's that. very risky on defense. But yeah, yeah, yeah. He cheats it, like whatever. And like that might change like when he's playing yeah. against guys that he knows he can't do that against. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's the hope. Um, but also it's like, oh, I I can't be fretting about like, is he gonna take the ball away from my primary when I'm picking in the top 10 in the lottery? Like I, I don't know. On it's like team. it's like when people on kitchen nightmares are like the customers love the food. We can't change the menu. It's like, well, you don't have any customers. Like you, there's nothing to, to worry about. Like right now, like you're taking the the ball away from a primary on a team that's picking in the lottery. And I think for certain teams like new Orleans, whenever it's like, yeah, I, I get it. But for some of these other yeah. teams, I I'd rather just roll the dice. Fair. This, this lottery is messy. This mock draft exercise went off the rails after pick number three. But I think that it's also fair to say that, there just aren't there aren't as clean of fits 
as we're going to see them right now is what may end up being the case in a few months, maybe even not in a few months, right? These teams are already constructed with enough talent. The NBA is a very talent rich league, right? So there are guys who are already established in spots where we're thinking about, I know Maxwell doesn't want to necessarily go in that direction, but we do have to think about what happens when you take the ball out of Paolo and Franz's hands. What does happen if you take the ball out of Tyrese Halliburton's hands? What happens if you take the ball out of Bradley Beal's hands, out of Jalen Green, Jalen Green's hands, out of Jay Nivey and, and Kay Cunningham's hands? Like these are established guys who we're projecting to have excellent long-term futures. Why are we necessarily going to disrupt the flow by bringing in the guy, bring in a guy who we think needs to have the ball in his hands, like in, and the or, most amount of developmental attention probably out of anyone in this draft. Exactly. So there, there's just uh, the Houston fit with Keontae George. I don't love that fit. The Washington Wizards fit with Jarris Walker. You can you can make a different argument. The Pistons fit with Cam Whitmore. You can make a different argument. Amen Thompson to the to the Magic with their second lottery pick. You can make a different argument. There are, there are a number of different directions that we can go. But I think it's just fascinating to talk out these scenarios and it comes back to, again, how deep this league is with established talent and the type of talent that's coming in, right? If you don't fit a specific role, it's getting harder and harder to project you in certain scenarios. That's kind of the case with a man. He's falling down the board or in our falling down the draft, I should say, not because of his talent alone to an extent, but more so we're trying to envision the situation where he actually fits because we haven't seen him do enough off the ball to give us the confidence more with a SAR, like, Hey, you're going to be able to fit into this role. No problem. We're going to plug you right in. We're just going to go up and down the floor and play basketball. And so it makes things incredibly complicated, but nevertheless, this is the, now NBA the board. Draft. Now the draft gets to be fun because the Thompson's and Whitmore are off the board <laughs> and we can talk about players that we are, are, are excited about. It's definitely going to shrink and, and, and come in a little bit. And then, yeah, we're going to have some real fun discussion, 10 down, all the way down to 30 here. We're going to take a really quick break. We'll be right back. All right, so we are back. I am up with number 10 overall. The Toronto Raptors have this pick in this scenario. So now we're, we're getting more out of the craziness that was our tankathon sim. We're getting back closer to what we're actually finding in the standings. So the Toronto Raptors are on the clock. I have a player who I have him higher on my board. And I think I like where I would project him to be. And I think it's a, a safer outcome. I, I'm still trying to retire that word. No, I have not thought of anything. It's been like three weeks since I've been trying to abolish the word safe. I haven't come up with something yet. If anybody does have a better name, or a better word, I should say, than, than safe when we talk about some of these prospects and in the message we're trying to convey, hit us up on social media. I think we'd love Instant to know here those ceilings and, and, and draft deeper. But Toronto Raptors, I will go Nick Smith just because they, they need a guard who can operate in the half court and who can get buckets, right? Like Keontae George could have been an answer if he would have fallen down this far. Jet Howard's my guy who I, I like him as a prospect overall, I think a little bit more the Nick Smith where we stand today. But then I see Nick Smith do some crazy things in, in the Arkansas game that we saw yesterday and finally coming back. And hopefully he's going to get it going, get it cooking for Arkansas a, a little bit. But his his combo guard ability, he can dissect the defense. He can break guys down. He has that athleticism, that speed in the half court. He has that shooting ability to where he can not only create his own shot, I think he can come off movement. I think he can involve him in multiple different play types. To me, he's always going to be a threat from the perimeter. And then you factor in his touch, his his soft makes, that, that floater he can get to when he gets two feet in the paint. He has one of these more all-around scoring games for a guard that – Boy, Toronto just needs any sort of injection into their half-court offense. So I would take a guard like Nick Smith with the 10th overall pick. Steven, you are up for the Portland Trailblazers. You're picking at number 11. I have a sneaky suspicion where you're going to go, but given that my suspicion for your last two picks would have been wrong, <laughs> I, I will not even uh, muster up a guess as to what you're going to do. So what are you doing at number 11? I'm going Taylor Hendricks for Portland. I that just is think what that... I think we're going to do. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I mean, easy easy roll, right? Like floor spacing on offense, weak side rim protection on defense, doesn't take the ball out of anybody's hands like Dame Lillard, Anthony Simons doesn't slow down the potential or the 
you know, the development of, you know, Shaden Sharp or Cam Reddish and can kind of help um, Joseph Nurkic, if that's the direction that they want to continue to go down at center, um, can help him on on cleaning up, uh, you know, shot blocking and rebounds and things like that. I just think that, you know, for, forgive me for the pun, but he is tailor-made for the NBA. And I think that uh, he's going to be a name that, that continues to rise. And I'm actually going to get an opportunity to go watch him live um, at the beginning of March. So I'm really excited about going to check him out. Absolutely. Taylor Hendricks has skyrocketed up boards. We, we once thought that the KOC was a little out there with ranking of 10th <laughs> overall in the ringers big board, but not really anymore, especially when you factor no. in the fit for some of these teams in the late lottery. Portland is a good fit. Steven, we don't know what's going to happen with Jeremy Grant. Are we sure Jeremy Grant's going to be back on the Portland trailblazers next year? Like we, we don't know. And if he's not, He's the type of forward slash big that you would want to slot in right next to somebody like Yusuf Nurkic, right? Like Yusuf Nurkic, he can handle, he can body somebody in the post. He's a good defensive rebounder, but he's not the type of shot blocker that that we would want our center to be in today's modern NBA. You could have somebody like Taylor Hendricks coming over from the weak side, right? Altering shots, blocking shots, and then spacing the floor on offense, another catch and shoot guy for Dame Lillard to find out of the pick and roll or Anthony Simons, whoever's running the pick and roll set. I really do like that fit with Taylor Hendricks. Maxwell, you're back on the clock. Number 12, Utah Jazz. Where are we going for the Jazz? Yeah, I'm taking the highest guy left on my board, and that's Jet Howard. Um, Love it. I have I really, really was falling hard for Jet earlier in the year, and he's kind of run into some bumps in the road in conference play. Like, he's... It, it really kind of that kind of starts with his room pressure. Like he's just not been able to get to the basket mm -hmm. at the same level as he was in the non-con part of the schedule. And he already wasn't doing that a lot in the non-con part of the schedule. So uh, his room pressure has dropped off as a result of settling more. His percentage on twos has dropped quite a bit. He is uh, was at one point during the season, he was 60% on twos. Now he's down to 41.5% on twos during conference play. Um, and it's eating into like his playmaking numbers too. Like his assists yep. are down, um, turnovers are up a little bit. Uh, and just defensively, there's still like a lot of warts here. He can be really inattentive off the ball. Um, he has like decent recovery tools and like he does a really good job of staying big and he can block guy shots at the rim, but he has to recover a lot because his feet aren't that quick. Like he gets beat off the dribble a, a pretty good amount. Um, and he just doesn't have the sharpest, quickest on ball reaction time, but the off ball stuff is, is really what kind of irks me more. Um, cause while he covers ground well, like he's just not that engaged on that side of the court. Um, I do think that's like a pretty fixable thing. And I think it's important to remember that he's also a late growth spurt guy. And a lot of times it takes those guys a while to get used to their new bodies, uh, kind of growing at things. I do think he's going to put a good amount of weight on his frame, which will help him quite a bit too. Uh, just in terms of his strength, being able to play guys off of his body more, um, but I still really, really buy the shot. I mean, this is a guy who in the conference part of the schedule, if we're gonna say what he's done bad there, he's shot almost 90% on free throws during the conference part of the schedule. He is a stellar outside shooter. He can really hit off of movement. And that's part of like why I like him more than guys like Grady Dick is that he has a little bit more shot variety. Like while they're both kind of iffy defenders, um, I, I buy what Jet's doing. Like Grady Dick, his movement numbers aren't as good as Jet's. Uh, with Jet, he can he can pull off the dribble a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just really like what he does as a shooter. And to use your word again, he's a, he feels pretty safe. Like, I really buy the floor on him. I think he's a professional. He's going to come to work. He's from that NBA bloodline. Um, but I do think there's a real ceiling here. Like, if he can get his body right and get, you know, kind of grow into his frame, get his strength better, pay attention on defense, and get that playmaking cooking a bit more because that, like, that vision is there. And if he can find yep. ways to get all the way to the basket and he has the footwork to do it. Like I think the nascent stuff is there, even though he's not the most explosive first step guy that if he gets a defense that's rotating or, you know, not totally set, I think there are ways Bingo. For him to get there. Find Walker does, Kessler right underneath the basket in, in Utah. If you catch the defense yep. off guard, they don't rotate back around, find the guy who's open. That's exactly what Utah kind of doesn't have enough of right mm -hmm. now right like we, we've seen it they, they've kind of gone a little stagnant now they've made some some moves with their team but it's kind of they're invested in these guys who are they're trying to create all their shots on the ball but they don't necessarily have those connective tissue pieces yeah. around guys like jordan clarkson around guys I, like Colin Sexton. i think he's gonna be that and i 
I think there's a chance he could be more. I'm not as confident in that chance coming to fruition as I was a month ago. Um, but I, I think it's on the table for him. No, I, I agree 100%. I still like, I still really like Jed Howard. Uh, I'm still buying in to, to pr- prove me wrong at this point <laughs> to, to get, get, get me to knock him down my board. So OKC Thunder, I'm up number 13. I would have loved Grady Dick here, but he is off the board. Steven effectively took him off the board. That's fine. Um, I am going to go. Screw it. I'm going to go Anthony Black. I'm going to go Anthony Black at 13. Ooh, okay. all. Reason why I'm doing that is because I think he just fits what the OKC Thunder are trying to do from an organizational standpoint, from a team motto standpoint. They want quick decision makers. They want guys who, as soon as they get the ball, they know what they're going to do with it, whether they're immediately catching and driving, catching and shooting, or redirecting that ball to where it needs to go. Anthony Black is the perfect type of player to thrive in that type of system, we envision him as this primary point guard because that's kind of what he's had to be for this Arkansas team, especially with the absence of Nick Smith. But he he doesn't have to be that guy. I understand that the jump shot needs to keep coming along for him to realize that type of a, a, a positional or situational outcome for him. But he certainly had moments where the jump shot's been there for him this year, albeit less times than more, but still... He's shown some flashes, and then when he does get that pressure on the rim, when he's able to get that step on the defense, he absolutely sees the floor. He will get the ball to where it needs to go, or he can finish the play himself. He's a better athlete than I think he gets credit for sometimes. So if you can trot out a lineup of SGA, Josh Giddy, J-Dub, Anthony Black, and insert big-bodied center here, that's a really interesting lineup to try and strategize against from a defensive standpoint. So – I think Anthony Black, just, Anthony Black just really fits what that team's doing. So that's why I'm going to take him at 13. Steven, you get to potentially make the Rich Richer, the Golden State Warriors, up at 14. They are another team who's kind of set in a lot of different places, but I think they could use some depth at certain positions. Where are you going to go at 14? Well, yeah, well, I was considering two players here. You took one of them and Anthony Black, so... That leaves me with potentially the best defensive playmaker in this draft class with Case and Wallace. I think that here at 14 for Golden State, he can spread the floor. He can keep the floor open, play off of Draymond Green very well. I would have really liked Anthony Black just to be another guy who can put pressure on the rim and hit some of their shooters while they're open. But for Wallace, he can be one of those open shooters and can kind of help take pressure away from the interior of the basket and then he can just pick up the tougher guard assignment, right? Like he can, or perimeter, whoever one through three assignment. He is very intelligent, plays uh, passing lanes very well, can bait ball handlers into doing something that they don't want to do. And then can either get one of the mugging steals, poke the ball loose to another defender, or he can recover and block a shot. Like he Mm -hmm. is just all over the place defensively. He, it has a reliable jump shot for now from the outside would really like to see if there's any of that, like Kentucky tagline of what else can he do that he hasn't got the opportunity to do in Kentucky would really like to see if there's anything else in his bag offensively. But I just think that golden state, they don't want, I think that we've seen that they don't want to take like any like high developmental guys. They don't want to take any theoretical guys. They want to get an instant impact ready to go uh, talent. And I think at 14, the best one available is Cason Wallace. Yeah, go go get another guy who's going to defend his ass off in the regular season, right? We yep. we saw that that's kind of why they had to backtrack on on the James Wiseman pick, and they ultimately had to use that to flip to get Gary Payton, somebody who, if he was healthy for this regular season stretch, I know he's going to be a guy who comes back in the playoffs, but if he was, like that's a guy who's going to go out and give you effort on the defensive end every single night in the regular season. The Warriors are in this position because they're not playing high-level defense every single game throughout mm-hmm. the regular season. We know what they're going to do in the postseason. We know that they're likely to, to win a few rounds, maybe even get back to the NBA Finals or everything breaks right for them, but they need better defense. They need guys, young legs, who are going to come in and lock in in the regular season, and there is nobody better at this spot in the draft to do that for them than Cason Wallace, who, oh, by the way, as Steven said, he can hit open shots, right? He's somebody yeah. who can even create his own off the bounce to an extent, got a really good floater when he gets two feet in the paint. He can hit on a number of looks for you. So I think that was a great pick, Steven. Atlanta, it. 15 overall, the Atlanta Hawks, Maxwell. You're back on the clock. Who are you going with? 
Yeah. So who's going to help Trey Young win basketball games? <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, I, so the next highest guy on my board is a guy that I kind of want to have the ball. And like, this is a real case of like, do you want to take the ball away from somebody? And also will that guy let somebody take the ball away from him? Um, so I'm going to go with somebody who I think is one of the best shooters in this draft class because Atlanta sneaky is like not a three point shooting team now. Like yeah. the days of Herter and Bogdanovich and Trey and everybody launches like that's over. This team they are does relying not... on AJ Griffin to really be like the main source of touch for them, which is fine because he yeah. is, but he's a rookie. Yeah. <laughs> so I think and, and Sadiq Bay being there might help too. Um, maybe we're loading too much up here on like offensive first forwards that aren't that fast and have some defensive warts, but I'm doing it. I'm taking Bryce Sensabaugh. Um, okay. I think it's, way, it's I love it. kind of murky from a fit perspective, but I think if things ever get ugly with Trey, you could have a lot worse starting points than AJ Griffin and Bryce Sensabaugh. Um, I, I just think he's a lights out shooter who has potential to be a, a phenomenal three level score. And I hope that if he's in an environment where he is being coached up on defense, that maybe that stuff starts to turn around. Cause I don't think he's that slow. I think he's very strong, which is going to help him a lot. Um, and I believe it was last year. Wasn't Malachi Branham like making comments to teams about how like he hadn't really been coached up on defense. Like, mm -hmm. wasn't it like a thing that came out publicly? So like, if that's the case, I'm sure that's probably happening with Sensabaugh. I really don't think Bryce is a bad on ball defender. I no, on ball, I, I don't worry don't. about it. It's, I don't it's worry about all him off ball stuff that probably, yep. as you're saying, it needs to be coached up. Yep. Yeah. And if, and if you can do that, then like, what a wonderful player to have, like line up three and try out like him and AJ and just like both of them can just run through anybody. And that's and when you start threes. to talk about like, if, if, if John Collins shot starts to fall, Right, mm -hmm. and you have AJ Griffin, and now you have Bryce Sense, but now now you've rebuilt that spacing that you lost to to a certain degree, or you're trying to get back to with, with the loss of somebody like Kevin Herter. No, I, I I get where you're going with that pick, Maxwell. I I, I love it 100. percent So I'm back on the clock. I have the Lakers pick via the the New Orleans Pelicans pick swap here at 16. Try to find a rookie that could actually play alongside LeBron James. That's that. I got one for you. Easier said than done. I think I have one. I'm going to go Jalen Hood Chifino. That's that's where I'm going to go. That. They they need another ball handler. They need uh, they need to keep finding guys who can take the pressure off of LeBron offensively. Somebody else who can make decisions in the half court. Kyrie Irving, notwithstanding, we don't know if he's going to go to the Lakers. We don't know if he's going to stay in Dallas, maybe even go to Phoenix, depending on what happens to Chris Paul. But we don't know what's going to happen with Kyrie Irving. But if we're operating in a, in a context in which they just need another point guard in the building, Jalen hood Shafino is a guy who, in the short term, he can play off of somebody like LeBron and AD. He can hit, he's sh showing that he can hit spot up shots. He can even create his, uh, his own looks off the dribble. He can be another one of these guys who redirects the ball in the half court. And as he continues to develop, as he cuts down on his turnovers, as he tightens up that handle a little bit, he can develop into that primary point guard to where the Lakers can look down their roster and say, wow, but when all of this is finally over, whenever it eventually ends, we may actually have a point guard here long term who is ready to grow with whoever else we bring in to this organization. So I'll take Jalen Huchifino at 16. Steven, you have the difficult task of making a pick for the I feel like we always stuff you with the new the New York Knicks pick. I feel like I'm constantly <laughs> helping the Knicks. Steve Steven always has to rebuild the Knicks for for Albert and, and make him smile whenever Albert eventually listens to this podcast. So where where are you gonna go with the Knicks at 17? This is tough, man, because they just added Josh Hart, right? So they just added a wing prospect, which is where I feel like I would go. But I keep saying consistently, like, they're so deep at, like, every position now. Like, the Knicks are legitimately a good basketball team. Yeah, they are. Top to bottom. So if I'm taking a player and I'm specifically drafting if I am – coach Tibbs not if I am literally anybody else on the planet if I'm taking a guy who I think plays defense is a, a great locker room guy is going to bust his butt all the time and I think because of injury 
might see some time on the floor. Give me Trace Jackson Davis here for the New York <laughs> Knicks because with Mitchell Robinson, with Mitchell Robinson getting hurt pretty regularly, <laughs> I think that there is going to be time available for Trace Jackson Davis here at the five. And I think that he is going to be an instant impact guy. Like he's a great rim protector. He's a great rebounder. He's grown as a, a as a connective big man. Like he, this past summer, he took like, play he did guard playmaking <laughs> skills so and stupid. drills and he is a reliable <laughs> decision maker out of the post so again like this is not who i have at the highest ranked on on my board but i'm i'm trying to draft like how i think someone who would play for the knicks in the immediate and i think trace jackson davis is the guy so in in steven's defense Maxwell, was it you that said in the group or was it somebody else who said that if we look back, like Trace Jackson Davis could be a guy who like, if we were Corey. redrafting a top 20, yeah. was it Corey that said that? Corey okay, was yeah, like, making the point that like he might be a guy that like a couple years down the road when there's a, a, a game where he has a box score where it's like 20, 10, and 4. Yeah. It's just like, yep, that that's Trace. That's like, Trace. Yep. And, 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 the Knicks. and two blocks a game and, you know, and to steal a game and very efficient. I just think that he would get – like of all the players that are available that that play the center position, I think that he would he's the most likely to get playing time out of anybody on the board right now. That is a pick. That is certainly it's Steven, you we have we have gone off the rails on draft deeper as I, as I I love it when we go off the rails because we're supposed to be that show who's trying to do things a little differently, entertain different lines of thinking and bring new ideas to the table. That is certainly one way to do it with a guy like Trace Jackson Davis. I, I understand. I understand where you're. I guess you're not buying a lot of Jericho Sim stock, huh? At, at that I mean, position. Sure. Because your like, argument about Mitch Robb getting hurt all the time is absolutely 100% valid. But then Jericho Sim steps up and who's backing him up? You know what I mean? Like who, like who are you drafting that you think legitimately gets playing time for the Knicks right now? No, I understand. I to to that yeah. point, th there is a log jam at, at at the guard spot. The the way I still think you could add another piece on the wing to make it interesting, like a Max Lewis or somebody like that. I think would be an interesting swing to take at the wing position. Even your guy Chris Murray, you 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 drafted to thought the about, Knicks once upon a nine Chris, in these yeah. scenarios. Like, I I I get it. I get it. I wouldn't do it. I don't think Maxwell would do it, but I get it. I get where your where your line of thinking is. So, Maxwell, you're up. You're making mm -hmm. a second pick for the Utah Jazz. So, so Stevens trying to save the Knicks. Maxwell's trying to save the Jazz. So, where, where, <laughs> where are you going at number eighteen? Yeah, I, 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 so I took Jet with my first pick for them, and I still think like a lot of scoring guards and bigs on this roster. Um, they need wing depth. They absolutely. Yeah, do. yeah. So I'm just like I, I want a wing again. I'm gonna go a little more upside swingy here. Um, not like anything crazy out of my order or anything like that. Um, but I'm going to go with Max Lewis here. Okay. Um, just because I think he's a bigger upside proposition and it feels like his star has fallen a little bit lately. Like he's, he's had some really bad turnover issues. Again, the turnovers have surpassed the assist per game. He had a six turnover game against Gonzaga the other day. And the shot has really fallen off. Like he's 25% from three in conference play. He's gone through a brutal cold stretch. I still totally buy the shot. I think the shot is like everyone I've talked to that it has seen him or worked with him has been like, the shot is great. Like the first thing that we notice with him is the shot. Um, looking at the synergy numbers, he's taken most of his threes off of the dribble this season, which is fascinating, which is awful like that shouldn't be the like there are very few players that should be the case for he's 27.3 percent on those which like isn't terrible uh for a wing prospect uh but it's not what he should be doing on catch and shoots he's 44.6 percent and like everything about the season he's having just feels to me like if you were surrounded by competent teammates who and i think i think a lot of the like pepperdine isn't playing well stuff like is not his fault this is a team with yeah. zero room protection and i think the fact that he is a bad defender is highlighted so much more by the fact that everyone else on his team is a bad defender. Like he can't get beat and have somebody that has his back. Nobody on that team has anybody's back defensively. Nobody is a good help defender. 
Um, so you get more plays where it looks like he's the he gets beat, and then the guy scores. Where with other teams, like yeah, guys get beat, but it's not the end of the world. Like they're able to sort of funnel him to somebody. He doesn't have that luxury. Um, after I interviewed him, like I, I think he's a really humble guy. I think he has a great attitude. I think he's going to work as hard as he can to get better, and he takes it very seriously. Like he knows what his flaws are, and he really wants to get better at them. Mm-hmm. Um, the and I think he's in a place game. in Utah, like he's going to be able to develop, and he's going to have the time yeah there as well with the great coaching so yeah i think it's a great place um for him to be um i, I yeah i'm just like i'm not scared at all about the shot falling off i'm more i'm more scared about like the turnover issues coming back up uh and the, it where it seems like he does still get a little too sped up um and i worry about what that looks like if he's going to be playing nba minutes right away i wouldn't think it would be the worst thing if they were to even just be like hey you're gonna play for salt lake a little bit the same way they did with ochai at points in the year um or not Salt Lake. What's their what's their G League team? Why is it escaping me? No, it's Salt Lake. Salt Lake Stars. Okay, yeah, yeah. Salt Lake Stars. So, yep. yeah, like I wouldn't I wouldn't hate that. Um, yeah, I, I I really like the upside here still, and I'm not very worried about the issues the, or the nits that people have started to pick with them. So I'm up at number 19, the Houston Rockets via the LA Clippers. I feel terrible. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. No, I do. I feel terrible that Gigi Jackson's falling this far down the board, right, in, in, in our mock scenario. But if there's one team where I do not want him to go, it would be the Houston Rockets, right? Just given the 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 poor habits that I've seen from him on the court, I do not want all of those to carry over into a scenario with the Rockets where they, they, they need more adults in the locker room. They, they need a different culture to continue being built there. More so, they need a defense-first culture to really start taking some sort of initiative with that team. Jabari Smith has had to do a lot for that team defensively. Tari Eason has to do a lot for that team defensively. So let's give him some help. Let's give him another wing who can guard up and down the lineup, who he's going to need some time to work some things out offensively. But I, I don't think offense is the Rockets' biggest problem right now. Right, especially if they're bringing in somebody like Stephen drafted them, Keontae George. Great, you're going to get another guard who can go put up buckets. I'm going to go Ray and Rupert. I'm going to just give them a a kick ass wing defender, forward defender who can continue to grow with this young roster. Houston's a a bad team. They're going to continue to be a bad team. There's there's no pressure on him to be great right out of the gate. He will be able to fail through his mistakes like everybody else. But when I watch him on the court, even when I don't love everything he does offensively, I don't see him have a lot of bad habits or things that I don't think can't get better with coaching and that I know what he brings to the table from a defensive standpoint. That He is a giant. I'm sorry, but he is a giant on the freaking court, man. Like When you watch him on tape, good Lord, I feel like he he looks... He, he feels like he's seven foot out there, but but he's not. It's just those massive arms. He's, he's yeah. walking around like he's Slender Man out there with those freaking <laughs> arms that he's able to. I was going to say to Elastic Man, around, but yeah, but Slender, Slender Man. Uh, uh, elastic Man, Slender Man, Mr. Fantastic, whatever nickname you want to give him, that's what he looks like on, on the court. But he he would be a fun developmental type of player to stick in Houston, and I'm not, I'm not worried about the developmental context with him in particular. So uh, Ray and Repair at number 19. For the Rockets, Steven, you're up, number 20, drafting for Heat Culture. The, not, not to make a pick for you. You're probably, I don't know where you're going to go with your pick. Th- doesn't this feel like a, a much better place for somewhere, somebody like Gigi Jackson to go to? Would be the Miami Heat, or you go in the opposite direction, like they're way too hard for him? I I mean, I think that he cares, right? Like, I think the the narrative about, like, the whole IG story um, – I oh, I think kinda, he does too. I think yeah. he cares a lot. Yeah. Um, I just don't think that Miami is uh, going to be particularly interested in in trying to get him better defensively. And like, if there's anything that Miami needs, it's um, I would say more so perimeter like wing help than than the forward. Like they just brought in Kevin Love, um, is a uh, like their latest signing. They got Bam Adebayo. I am going to give them kind of an upside swing, though. I'm going to give them Dariq Whitehead. I think that um, this is a, a perfect spot for him because he can space the floor. I think that it's going to give him time to come back kind of comfortably off of an injury. And with the contracts coming due of, you know, uh, Max Struess and 
and uh, who's the other guard? I'm sorry, I, I can't remember. Um, Duncan Robinson, Gabe, Gabe, Vin- Gabe Vincent, Gabe Vincent. Vincent. No, 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 Gabe Vincent. Yeah, the the good one, Gabe Vincent. Um, I, I think that adding some 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 help on the wing would be smart. And Whitehead has scary injury history, and I could see that being a reason why people have cooled down on him. But even in his most recent game, like he's showing that he can still consistently space the floor uh, against Syracuse. And I know it's against a 2-3, so I don't know how much you want to read into that. But I still think that the talent is there, and I think that Miami is a good spot to, to pick up somebody like him. I cooled on him, the the injury thing notwithstanding. I cooled on him yeah. because he he can shoot. He's shown he can yeah. shoot, but that's that's really all of what he's shown offensively. He has been a train wreck defensively. Now that whole Duke team has been a train wreck defensively outside of when Lively put up the, the awesome box score yeah. that he did against North Carolina. So I, w- I will give him a little bit of a pass because there's no real team construct to better his defensive habits. I guess that that's how I will put it. Yeah. But- and I think that the injuries don't help him either. Like kind of similar to how we were looking at AJ Griffin last yes. year, like, how athletic is he? Like, how can he move defensively and things like that? I think that the injuries kind of limited and kind of inhibited his ability to kind of show off in those areas. Now, that's not to say that Derek isn't going to also need time to prove that he can do those things as well. I just think that with the hype that he had coming in, the skills that he's continuing to show, even though coming off of some pretty gnarly injuries, I, I just think that the, that the potential is too high for a wing player for Miami to pass up on. Maxwell, you are on the you are picking for the other team in New York via the Phoenix Suns, aka the the massive Kevin Durant trade that that took part about a week and a half ago. You are up at twenty one. Who are you bringing into Brooklyn? Yeah, I'm I'm actually going to go GG here. Um, that, that now that makes a let lot of Brooklyn sense. cook. Yeah, I mean that's all like all you can do. Like this is a team that's in a really weird spot and you don't have total control over your own destiny. So when you get a chance to take this big of a swing, I kind of feel like you should just do it. Um I I like this roster a lot. I just don't know how competitive they can be. Um are they a team I'd want to play in like the first round of a playoff series? Hell no. I don't want to deal with Nick Laxton and Mikhail Bridges and Dorian Finney-Smith and Camp Johnson. Like, that does not sound like fun. I, I don't want to play them. But at the same time, like, they need a star. And is Gigi going to be one? Do, if I thought so, I would have taken him a lot higher. But I think that that upside is within him. And I think that you you do it. He's been dreadful in SEC, play, like, plain and simple. Because like, I think so many people are hung up on the IG Live thing that they're not talking about the fact that he is just not been able to put the ball in the basket for a long time. And he has not made any in season improvements as far as like reading the court and making passing reads. His defense has gotten worse. Like I liked the guy that we saw at the beginning of the season a lot. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. And that that's kind of tapered off. And part of that could be competition and part of it could be circumstances. And there's a million things that it could be, but that guy still exists. That guy is still the same human being. And if I have this big of a swing, I'm going to take it and say, Hey man, look like, you want opportunities like here you are you're in new york city you're in a major media market you have a chance to become the star of this team but you're gonna have to do a lot of work to get there um because you don't have an easy path to minutes you're gonna you know play in the g league a little bit like you're gonna have to earn your keep um but there's a huge opportunity here if you want to do the work to get it and i i know it's 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 not an easy path to minutes we know that there's a positional log jam technically but we, we don't know how many of those forwards at the same time are going to be there in Brooklyn long term, right? Like, I think Mikhail Bridges is pretty safe to say, yeah, they, they want him to be a Brooklyn net. Otherwise, they would have flipped him again for mm-hmm. four first round picks or whatever the reported offer was from, from the Memphis Grizzlies. They would have done that. Cam Johnson is a, a restricted free agent. We, we don't know what's going to happen with him. Dorian Finney Smith, very movable contract, potentially bringing more assets. We don't know what's going to happen with him. Regardless, if you bring in G.G. Jackson to Maxwell's point, this isn't a team that's going to be expected to compete necessarily for anything high in the playoffs anytime soon. Now that they've kind of torn down the star power that was Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and and even before that, James Harden. So you bring them into a good developmental situation. I I agree. Take the swing on somebody like G.G. 100%. I get to pick for the Portland Trail Blazers. At number 22, this is via the New York Knicks, a.k.a. that that wonderfully fun Josh Hart trade that Steven alluded to earlier. 
their second pick. Portland, Portland's fun. Portland's yeah. fun because we already gave them Taylor Hendricks, so we assure we shored up their front court a little bit. They too, they do need wing help, but like what? What wing am I really gonna go with? Go with here. I mean, we can give them. We can give him a guy like Chris Murray. I don't feel great about that. I guess probably the safest pick on the board would be Colby Jones. And I think that's where I'm going to go. <laughs> they get the Josh wing. Hart back. They, they, in a way, they do kind of get they get they get a cheaper Josh Hart in theory, right? So he's another 6'6 six, six guard, 6'5, six, 6'6 six, six guard who can handle the ball, make plays for others. He's had a fantastic season at Xavier, really growing as a scorer, right? Gro- growing as an on-ball scorer. I didn't realize how well he can get downhill and get to the basket. He's done that quite a bit for Xavier. The spot-up shots fall on for him. He can get to the free-throw line. And then defensively, I don't love his defense, but the best version of Colby Jones can guard one through three, ideally, in the NBA. And that's the kind of defensive versatility that you would want to be drafting into at this point in, in, in a scenario like this. So, yeah, I will take Colby Jones at 22 for the Trailblazers. Steven, your guys on the board – you could reunite long lost brothers. You, yeah. you could do this. You could be the one to do it, but I have a feeling you won't. Nevertheless, where are you going to go? Yeah. So I've been pretty low on this guy until pretty recently. And I'm starting to um, come down, I guess, with the Jordan Hawkins sickness. I think that he's oh a great fit here, especially Love with it. the offense that they run in Sacramento. You know, when Darren Fox is, you know, being his normal jitterbug self and and finding his way to the rim, creating pressure. Um, just another guy that he can kick the ball out to reliably and shoot. I'm um, running off of DHOs with the Monta Sabonis cutting off of him, um, really improving um, as a cutter throughout the year, um, showing more than just him being a, a dynamite shooter also, and showing the, the desire and the competitiveness on the defensive end as well. So I just think that he is mo- one of the more – well-rounded two men in the league right now, or in, in college basketball right now. And I think that he kind of, he get he fortifies their depth a lot, which if the Kings, the Kings don't necessarily need depth, but Jordan Hawkins, it doesn't hurt to add him on, on, on this roster. What's, what's changed for you with Jordan Hawkins, Steven, because really it's, it's, it's more of what's changed with him for all of us because he's drastically mm. risen up our composite board. He's now sits at 21 on our composite. That was not the case one board ago, two boards ago. What, what, what really changed for you, for you in particular to spike him up and say, yeah, Jordan Hawkins belongs near the top 20. Well, yeah. So I've kept him in the early second round range and I just, I mainly looked at him as a shooter. Um, but just seeing the subtleties that he gives you on the defensive side, he is much more of a complete player than I was probably originally looking at, at the beginning of the year, especially on offense too, right? Like he's not just a shooter. Um, he can, set a, can attack closeouts well. He's got some fun around the basket game as well. And uh, I just I just think that he was more complete than I was originally giving him credit for. So going back and looking at him more recently, um, just going back and looking at him more recently, it's just there's really not a lot of nits to pick other than I would say size. I don't know if he really is 6'5", but I think taking him this like late in the first, like as a as just a, a rotational flamethrower like you could do worse so maxwell mm-hmm. another team you see so you got to save the utah jazz now you're you're saving the brooklyn and man you you have a lot of responsibility you have to save <laughs> yeah i get to team. save the jazz again later too yeah <laughs> it, it is really funny how this order worked out but you get to save the team that has had to live through the disaster that was the superstar pairing or the superstar trio I guess I should say. So pick number two for the Brooklyn Nets at 24. Who are you taking? Uh, so I don't love the idea of like, you just keep swinging for upside. Do it a million times. Like, so if I'm bringing in Gigi, like Gigi is the project. Like Gigi yes. is the guy that like, I am devoting all of the developmental attention to Gigi. So for my other guy that I'm bringing in, I want a guy who's like mature and ready to be an adult and is a dog and is going to get after it. Um, Brooklyn for years now has really not had a good defensive point guard. Um, Marcus Sasser is just staring me right in the face. And if we're trying to be competitive and I can roll out lineups with like him, Mikhail Bridges and Nick Claxton in it together, like that just, I've got a huge smile on my face right now. Like I absolutely love every single second of that. Um, Yeah. Give me Sasser. I, the three point percentage has really come around. 
and people forget like his eye was decimated which is like a really reasonable reason to have a shooting slump is not being able to to see uh the basket in which you're trying to put the ball in um yeah and i think he's taken another step forward as a decision maker he's a little bit more control of himself yet again um but the idea of just him being a defender being a guy who can catch and shoot, giving you even more shooting on the scene, but really just giving some defensive nastiness to a point guard rotation that has been a lot of, you know, Kyrie Irving, Patty Mills, like Seth Curry's not, a, you know, a terrible defender, but he's not a good one either. You've got Cam Thomas out there with like Dinwiddie. I don't love that as a guard backcourt. Um, I think Sasser could really do something with this team. I love that pick. I'm Same. envious of that pick. I'm very jealous of that selection. I would have loved to take Sasser with one of my picks upcoming here, but nevertheless, he is off the board. I am back on the clock. 25. The Memphis Grizzlies are up. I would love to take a draft and stash swing. I would love to take my guy Bilal Koulibaly here. Ooh. I will not do it. I will instead. This is, this is for you, Tyler Rucker. This is a, 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 a nice little kiss in the wind for you. I'm going to go Julian Strother here. At 25, I'm gonna I'm gonna reach a little bit down into the second round of our composite board. I believe we have Strother at 34, if I'm correct. Yes, 34th yep. in our composite rankings. The Memphis Grizzlies need additional help on the wing, more so additional help on the wing. First of all, we don't know what's going to happen with Dylan Brooks. We don't know if he's definitely going to be there long term. But even if he is. You have Zaire Williams. Zaire Williams, if Memphis wants to make another sizable trade, he would probably have to be in a deal, right? Along with Dylan Brooks as a sign and trade could possibly be in the deal for another star. I think they're going to need wing depth one way or another. And Strother, I, I, I cooled on Strother to knock him out of the first round on my board a while ago. Guys, he's had way too many good shooting performances of late for me to be like, yeah, yeah I can't take Julian Strother in the mm-hmm. first round at this point. So he is a big bodied wing who is at this point, a knockdown spot up shooter who again, another guy similar to Colby Jones, who I don't love him defensively, but if it works out on that end, another guy who I could see guarding a few positions on, on the floor, not just being locked into one position. So just giving the Memphis Grizzlies trusted, more experienced depth at a position of need. Give me Julian Strother on the wing for the Grizzlies. Steven, Saving the Indiana Pacers. You're yep. picking for them again. You took Grady Dick at number eight. I stand Who by are my you decision. going to add to that depth at 26th? I'm taking I'm taking my guy. I'm taking Chris Murray here. And I think that Great it just pick. it makes it makes way too much sense. You're adding another reliable floor spacer, another reliable switchable defender, help side rim protector. Um, scales down beautifully into a role. Most NBA role players were like the guy on their team. And if there's anything that Chris Murray is for Iowa this year, he is their guy. He does like essentially everything, save maybe a little bit of playmaking. But I just think that Indiana in this draft has added some pieces that just mature, grown, sharp decision makers. And I think that that's what you continue to do when you have the core that they have. So Chris Murray here, I'm thrilled to death if I'm Indiana and I have him at 26 because he is like 17th, I want to say, on my board currently. So, yeah, picking him up at 26 is a, is a great get. Great, great selection. I love that pick. Maxwell, you are back on the clock. You have the Utah Jazz again, as you alluded Surprise. to. Surprise. <laughs> via the philadelphia 76 he, he's saving the jazz he's saving the nets this is what he's doing today but he he loves this project who are you going with the 27 all right i'm ready for you guys to get really mad at me here um oh, i'm ready boy. to get mad at you this is the highest rated player on my board that makes sense so i have like leonard miller ahead of him and like this is just i a was very, gonna like, guess leonard miller a very big heavy roster and like i i just don't like the fit for him very much oh he's doing it i'm taking a guy who barely made the mock posit solely because i had this man so high this is the range of the draft when you just draft a guy that you think is an nba player and i think this guy's an nba player i'm taking tucker devries for the that is the most useful that is i I know here's the bottom line this is a team that still (laughs) needs shooting they need wings 
I believe that Tucker DeVries is, is going to be a wing who can shoot and play in the NBA. Um, generally, when you're looking at mid-major players that stick in the NBA, they're guys that dominate their competition. Um, he is leading a Drake team uh, to a very good record. He's scoring almost 20 points a game. He's taking seven threes a game and making 40.5% of them. He is very physically strong. He can put the ball on the floor. He is, let me pull that back up. So the other thing with DeVries too is like, he's not solely a catch and shoot guy. Like he is also a like just ridiculous, um, like take a side dribble and knock it down. If, if there's a, a tough closeout type of type of shooter, um, or synergy doesn't want to load right now as I'm going to pull these numbers <laughs> up. Uh, but he is okay. 38.4% off the catch 42.9% on threes off the dribble. And he's taken 42 of them on the year, but he's like an exceptional pick and roll player. Like, I don't think that element of his game is talked about enough that like he plays really low with his dribble and he's very strong. So he's able to get inside the arc, get decent looks there. Very heady passer um defensively like yeah he's a poor athlete like he's not got good foot speed for an nba player he is impervious to back cuts like he is one of the most attentive and smart off ball defenders that is going to be in this class look it 20 like this is the mistake everybody made with andrew numhard last year was there was a guy that people thought oh yeah that guy's an nba player and they didn't take him i think tucker is that dude i'm taking him it is Gordon a pick Hayward 2.0 it is certainly a pick. I understand exactly why Maxwell did it. And I think given the case that he laid out, I actually think it was a good pick for Utah to make, given that they have multiple selections, they have three picks. Why not take a guy who you're confident is going to be an NBA player and who could fill a role for your team? So Tucker DeVries is off the board at Get 27. Your yeah. I'm back up at 28. The Charlotte Hornets via the Denver Nuggets. Can I phone a friend? Can I ask the both of you guys who you would take between two players here? Because I'm I'm very torn on what to do. I know I'm going to do a draft deeper first, but who would you guys take between Julian Phillips and Jalen Molson? Julian Phillips. For the Hornets, I would take Jalen Wilson. That's, I think, what I am going to do. Be- only because... The Julian Phillips outcome as a defensive weapon for the Hornets, a team that absolutely needs, first of all, the Hornets need a little bit of everything. That that team, I, I can't say enough times that that team has been a dumpster fire and they just, they need legitimate, legitimate help. I think Jalen Wilson provides that for you, but he is the shot maker right now, despite the gripes I've had with his efficiency on, on different podcast episodes, he's at least the shot maker who can come in. He is not a liability offensively. He can still space the floor. and He offers some defensive upside and some positional versatility. So we know that they, they need a little bit of help on the wing. Michael Jordan, that, that front office, they love taking guys from these big name colleges with these big pedigrees as far as careers go. So I think Jalen Wilson would be a, a reasonable first round pick for Charlotte um, all things considered near the end of the draft. So Steven, you're up at 29 for the Clippers via the Bucks. I am going to take another riser on my board. Um, Metcalf is going to love me because I know for the Clippers, we have been kind of shop working them, them taking a point guard in our most recent mock draft. We had them taking Mike miles. I think if this guy was available, this would be the route that I would go next time. And that's Kobe Bufkin out of Michigan. I'm going to take, I'm going to take Kobe Bufkin. I think that Clippers going point guard is, is going to be the way that they go despite them getting bones Highland. I just, the length that he has at his position, the, the shooting, the passing, the competitive nature on the glass. Like he does a lot of really good things from the point guard spot that I think and he compliments players well. Like, look at what he's doing with Jet Howard. Look at what he's doing with Hunter Dickinson. He plays within himself and just always yields positive production. And I just think that at his age, at his position, with the maturity that he's already showing and how much stronger he's going to get and how much more that's going to improve the other areas of his game, give me Kobe Bufkin here. I think I'm the last guy who's held out on ranking him on my board altogether because I, I I really didn't think he was going to be a this year guy, but now, especially over the last three to four I didn't weeks, either. 
it's yeah, yeah you, we can't ignore it at this point. Kobe Bufkin is very likely to be a guy in the 2023 NBA draft. I can promise you the next big board update I do, I, he will not only be on it, he's going to be much higher than I could have initially anticipated. He has been kick-ass awesome for Michigan. I thought when you said about Metcalf, I thought you were going to go Adembona. I, I would have also liked the Adembona pick here too, but nevertheless. Yeah, either one. Kobe Bufkin is a great swing to take at the guard spot for the Clippers. Maxwell, to finish off this draft, the Indiana Pacers, they they need your help. They're tired of Steven making selections for them. They, they I'm just kidding, Steven. They, they, where, uh, where are you going at number probably. 30? All right, so we took Grady Dick for them. We took Chris Murray for them. I so now they like which like is kind of what they need. Like they need like just more size. Like I love the Chris Murray pick for them. Um, it's still a pretty like athleticism and high upside lacking roster. Um, and while I don't think this guy's like the best athlete, I think he would make a lot of sense for them and he gives them more potential size. Um, and a lot of upside. I'm going to take Noah Clowney for them. Um, I love that. Thank you. Which is like, yeah, I, I just think that he kind of works and makes sense there. Like they've, they're a team that just, they just play the best guys like period. And that's led to them basically playing like four guard lineups with Miles Turner quite a bit this year. Um, and like if Jalen Smith isn't getting the shot to go, it gets a little trickier where I think with Clowney, it's like kind of the same idea, except a guy who's four years younger. It's like, you're really starting the clock earlier, better athlete than Jalen Smith, better cutter than Jalen Smith knows how to play without the ball. I really like his attitude. Like I think the stuff with him yeah i think the stuff with him too like taking a reduced role and being like yeah i get it i think that's a real sign of maturity you can take your time with him if you want to stick him in fort wayne you can um but yeah i think he would bring a real upside to their team and i think that he makes sense from just like a they need to be bigger standpoint so noah Clowney rounds out this draft one through 30 before we do our final sign-offs and close out this episode. I have a question, boys. Mm -hmm. There's one mm -hmm. player who did not go in this exercise who I would 100% bet goes in the draft in real life, could even go top 20. We did not pick him at all. Yep. I specifically did not pick him at 28 because I was hoping that you guys wouldn't pick him so that we could have a discussion. Traquavion Smith out of NC State did not go in our mock draft exercise. Now... He has actually soured a little bit for me. I'm curious if he's also soured in that same way for you guys, given that we didn't select him. Just starting with myself, I'm looking at his numbers from last year, and I've, I've watched some tape this year and compared it to some tape last year. I really don't think he's gotten that much better. I really don't. Uh, see, I, I, I do think he's gotten – a little bit. A little bit the, better. I'm I think saying I don't think he's gotten much better. It's a little bit better. I think my concern with him is still just like kind of the same one I had last year, which is like, what do you do on a winning team? Because I feel like the scoring guard archetype, if I don't trust you on defense, is still just like, okay, well, then what? Like, if you can come in and get buckets, but you really don't have the size and you're going to get picked on on the other end, like, he's a good enough athlete that I do think if he gets stronger, like there's a world where that changes, but he just hasn't gotten good enough better that I'm like, like earlier that's, in the year. That's right. I'm, I'm not saying so he didn't improve at him. all, but and he did not, he didn't take the leap Maxwell that I think you and I would have wanted him to take the inside that's scoring. Like seemed like it was going to be there. And now it's not, it's not the, sh that's, the that's outside the shooting hasn't even gotten better either. No. And I, I don't mind that. Like, it takes he, really like, hard he, shots. Yeah, if that was worse, it would right. be whatever. It's he's the, still it's, making some of the same poor decisions, though. Like, it's the inside the arc scoring with like you've got Jarkel Joyner, you've got like Casey Morsell, like you've got guys that can knock down shots around you, and you are not doing better at the basket, and that's a big concern to me. Like I, I, I still just don't know how good he can be if like that's what his rim pressure game is, and this is what his defense is. Steven, you you feel great about him being a top 30 guy or I'm, I'm i'm assuming you kind of have your share of questions as well given that you didn't select him either well yeah i mean i considered him at the sacramento spot but then i was like jordan hawkins kind of offers like the same 
crazy, you know, microwave scoring ability, but he's also shown to be stronger, more athletic, and a better defender. I don't think he's so, more athletic, he's but I do better... think I am with you a thousand percent on the defense, though. Yeah, well, it, maybe not more athletic, but I would say that they're comparable. Like neither one of them are like way outside of each other athletically, I would say. And then, like I said, like who's got the more NBA ready body? Like Turk, for all the improvements that he's shown, he's still probably not where you would like him to be physically. Um, to hold up in the NBA and again like injuries suck and when you get close like when you're closely compared to somebody else like you have to find differentiators and it doesn't help his case that he he's he's sustained injuries this year he has the high-end outcome of a lottery type talent but I think it's going to take more for him to realize that ceiling than I initially anticipated before this year started I also you guys made Tyrese great Hunter, points. right? Well, Tyrese Hunter's not even on my big board anymore. But that talk about oh, oh the how the mighty have fallen from from how I held them right, in personal but like, regard. But the lottery same thing. level outcome, right? Yeah. But yeah, and and I just I don't know. I, I haven't seen Terquavion Smith take the type of leap that, that I would have wanted them to take. Like I take I, I watched yeah. the North Carolina some of the North Carolina C State game today. He, he he just doesn't he just doesn't jump off the page like I want him to. When when you compare him to some of the other types of players that are on the board in that 15 to 30 range that we just went through, right? Like, I would probably still rather have Bryce Sensabaugh. I would rather have Jalen Huchifino. It's a conversation between him and Trace Jackson Davis, but maybe I'd rather take a swing on Max Lewis. I'd rather take a swing on Rain Repair. Dariq Whitehead's an interesting one. G.G. Jackson has top 10 upside if, if he freaking works out. Colby Jones, Jordan Hawkins, Marcus Sasser, Julian Strother, like, these are players who I think we have more confidence in. We've more or less seen how they get from point A to point B in their careers and can further develop and become legitimate rotational talents. Terquavion Smith has all the talent that those guys do, but because of how he's built, because of how he plays the game, and how he's sort of pigeonholed positionally because of those two things, it's going to take a lot more work for him to, to realize that outcome. And I just don't know if I would feel comfortable being like, yeah, I'm going to raise my hand and sign myself up for that. And that that's just kind of where I'm at. I could absolutely flip that by the time we do this next mock action. I could take him to like 18 for, for all I know, who knows how that's going to break out. But this is where we landed for this edition of our mock positive draft. I will have the full draft order up and we will share it on social media along with the release of this episode. So be able to follow along with a physical copy But thank you so much for everyone who got to listen to this episode of the podcast. We always have fun in doing these mock draft exercises with all of you. Steven, where can the good people find you? What have you been working on lately for No Ceilings? Well, yeah, they can follow me on Twitter at Steven G Hoops. Uh, Just took this past Sunday off and so glad that I did because Paige just crushed it with her debut. Yes, she She did. She was fantastic, and it sounds like we're going to be getting to see some more of her writing. So I'm probably out of a job now. So thanks a lot, Paige. <laughs> but uh, um, all my written work that I will have posted will be at noceilingsmba.com. And um, I will be hosting Home and Away tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. I'm going to have uh, two guests on. And uh, one of them is a friend of the program, Bryce Simon. The other one is other friend of the program, uh, Adam Spinella. So I'm going to have two guests on. A two for uh, yeah, I'm going to be doing unfair. my I'm best. I'm going shenanigans on this. There's, there's, um, dude, come there's, on, man. You just no, gotta... look. Hey, we all get, we all get one home and away episode. You're taking two good guests. No fair. No I fair. I mean, I mean, anybody else could have to. No, I just, <laughs> I, Bill Simmons inspired me this week, so I was like, let me do my best, Bill Simmons. So, um. <laughs> Two, two awesome guests. I'm glad that I had them on. It was a fun episode. I can't wait for everybody to listen to it. Maxwell, you had a you had a kick-ass piece come out of your own on NoSillingsNBA.com yeah, of late. You interviewed freaking somebody who we didn't end up taking in the first I round of this exercise. Yeah, go. But mm-hmm. you, you, you found a way to sneak him in mentioning him in the podcast. You interviewed Leonard Miller. Tell the people about that piece. Yeah, it was, it was really fun. I, I talked to Leonard Miller. He's a guy that I was extremely skeptical of last year. 
Uh, and I think he's done a really wonderful job with the Ignite, just improving so many elements of his game. And he's another guy, like Steven mentioned earlier, like in-season improvements. Like he's he's getting better. His turnovers are coming down. He's been phenomenal finishing around the basket. His motor is absurd. Like I really think he's going to carve out a role, even if it's just as an energy guy. Like I think I think coaches are going to love him because of how, how hard he plays and like he just knows like, yeah, like that's, that's a, a good way to like get on a basketball court. It's just play really hard. So I spoke with him, broke down his game, had a really fun time with that. And I've got a piece coming out on Tuesday, looking at Kobe Brown on Missouri, one of the most versatile players in college basketball. And I got really into the weeds on numbers about players that take a big shooting leap in their final college season before turning pro uh, and into just versatility numbers as well. And what that means for, for getting an opportunity in the NBA and staying in the NBA. I got really, really into the data on that one. So I hope people check it out and enjoy it. I'm going to actually get a chance to watch him in Des Moines Hodge this uh, upcoming weekend. So um be looking forward to my kind of takeaways from that. No ceilings is everywhere. We're always traveling, trying to do fun stuff, talk to some cool people. I'm really proud of the interview that Maxwell did with Leonard Miller. I'm really proud of the scouting Absolutely. work Steven's going to be doing on the road. I'm also very proud of Corey, who also got to interview CD Sissoko. That that podcast yes. is up on this feed. If you have not listened to it or watched that film breakdown podcast, please go ahead and do so on the YouTube channel or here on this very podcast feed. As for me, you can find me on Twitter at Draft Deeper. As always, I have a monstrous rookie rank column coming out where I did not just write about the top guys who we're, we're hearing all the time come up on the rookie rank ballots, the Paolo Bencaros, Benedict Matherins, Walker Kesslers. I wrote about some guys who aren't getting as much buzz. So I have yeah. 23 total players covered. I got words on all 23 of them coming out on this edition of the rookie rank. Please go ahead and check that out again on nosillingsnba.com. But until we are able to meet again on this podcast feed, thank you all so much for listening. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week.